All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, but the righteousness of God has come. It has been revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 3, we finally start to hear the good news. We've been hearing the bad news, the scary news, but now we start to hear the good news that God has a plan to save, deliver us, and redeem us in His grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. Hey, this is Mark Milan. We're in a Bible study of the book of Romans, and this is chapter 3. Well, here we go, Romans chapter 3. Now we start to unpack the good news, the good news of the gospel, and Paul's going to take us on a journey. Starting in chapter 3, continuing through 4, 5, 6, 7, there's a, a deeper, we go down this well of depth, and then he takes us up out of that as we finally reach Romans chapter 8. I mean, it's magnificent how the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul in this letter. I think you're really going to enjoy it. There's a lot of things to grab a hold of in this chapter as we start to unpack the good news of the gospel. Okay, this is Romans chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, and I have some notes on the side, and then after that I'd love to close with a couple of questions. I'm really glad you're here. Uh, I pray that the Lord will speak to you today, and I pray that He speaks to me as well. Let's dive in and see what God has to say. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Other translations say the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Would their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar as it is written, quote unquote, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But, If our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath upon us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Some might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, quote-unquote, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is just. In other words, there was this doctrine beginning to be birthed that God had revealed, the good news was that God revealed his righteousness and goodness through Jesus Christ. And because his righteousness has been revealed, my sinfulness is not brighter and bigger and bolder than the magnificence of God's righteousness. So if that's the case, then my falsehood brings attention to his truthfulness. My sinfulness brings attention to his righteousness. In other words, this argument had come up, well, why don't I just keep sinning, right? Because if I continue to sin, doesn't it bring God more glory in showing his mercy and grace? And Paul's like, no, 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 that is jacked up. What you're, That whole thinking right there is all messed up. So he's starting to, to, to deal with an argument like a good lawyer would, bringing up objections to this idea that the righteousness of God has been given to us. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Right? In other words, how do we make sense of this? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin, as it is written. He's quoting the Old Testament here. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. 
There is no fear of God before their eyes. These are all Old Testament scriptures that he's quoting. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one, listen, therefore, no one, say that with me, no one, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, rather Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Whoa, there's a thought. Is that what the law was given for? In other words, I've been trying to obey the law every day. I've been trying to obey, obey, obey. And if you're really honest with yourself, you know that as you try to obey, you end up sinning more. It's like telling a little kid, hey, you can touch everything in the room, but I'm trying to point to it. Don't go in that door. Don't open that door right there, okay? Every other door you can go through, but don't go through that door. And what do the kids do? What's behind that door? Let's go behind that door, right? Why? That's human nature. It's our fallen nature, sin. We, this is why the the Ten Commandments were, you know, thou shalt not, right? Thou shalt not. It was all these things, don't do, don't do, don't do. It was a few things to do, but most of it was don't do, don't do, don't do. Because that's how we are wired naturally without the salvation of Jesus Christ and the power of his working spirit. So the law was given. I talk about this a lot in the book of Galatians, if you want to study that book uh, and do that Bible study. But the law, Paul unpacks this idea even further there. The law was given to point us to Christ. The law was given to keep the people of God held until the salvation of the Messiah would come, until he would be revealed. But the law was also given to teach us about the righteousness and the holiness of God. And the law is good. Jesus did not come to destroy the law or to abolish the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. That's what he came to do. And the law is good, but it cannot make me good. The law is holy, but it cannot make me holy. The law is righteous, but it cannot make me righteous. So that's the problem, right? And he starts off the letter saying, is there any advantage to having the law? And of course he goes, yes, there is an advantage. Of course there is. But that advantage doesn't solve the problem of salvation. Jesus does. So let me read verse 20 again. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. What does he mean by that? Well, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. Okay, there's something I never thought about, but now it's in my mind, right? Now now I'm, I'm aware and conscious of my neighbor's wife. Why? Because the law has just introduced me to that idea. So, thou shalt not worship idols. What idols? Now my mind is focused on idols. That's just the way we are. So, the law of God could not penetrate and bring about the transformative work of salvation Jesus had to come and do it, and then through his spirit, he completes it in us. So let's, let's continue to read, because this is, this, is, this is the writing of Paul that's so great. Verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophecies testify. This righteousness is given by faith. So there's a righteousness of God that comes to you, comes to me, apart from the law, uh, separate. It, It has nothing to do with the law. It comes to us through faith. This righteousness is given through faith. Verse 22, in Jesus Christ, to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be justified? It means that God chooses to treat you just as if you'd never sinned. Justification is a legal term. That means that the trial has been concluded and 
the verdict has been given and all conclusive facts have been measured and taken into account and the final decree is that you are not guilty you are not guilty you are innocent of all charges and you go well i'm a sinner how's that possible Yes, it's possible because Jesus took your sin and because Jesus was, the wrath of God was poured out on Christ and everything that your sin was supposed to receive in retribution was put upon him. He took your place and you have accepted that gift on his behalf. Therefore, you are not held accountable for the sin. Another legal term is double jeopardy. If you know anything about law, one person cannot be tried and declared innocent and then retried for the same um, for the same crime so if you have a crime against you and they they take you to court and they find you not guilty you cannot be retried by the legal system again for the same crime that's called double jeopardy uh, they could try to find something else on you but not that thing and when it comes to sin all of heaven has declared you and me righteous all of heaven has declared you and me holy and justified before god not because of our good works not because of our righteousness but because of the righteousness of god revealed in jesus christ because of my faith in what christ has done for me i receive this as a free gift let's read it again but now apart from the law of god has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify this righteousness is given through faith in jesus christ to all who believe there is no difference between jew and gentile verse 23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by christ jesus your redemption and my redemption came through christ jesus god presented christ as a sacrifice of atonement for our sins god presented christ you didn't ask for Christ to be sent. God sent him. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by what? By good behavior, to be received by my obedience, to be received by observing the law, to be received by my self-righteousness. No, it says it very clearly, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate what? his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished in other words there were sins built up there and he did it to demonstrate his righteousness that's the second time he says that at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in jesus christ god is just he deals with sin he has dealt with sin but he's dealt it in the person of jesus christ so if i have faith in jesus christ god has dealt with my sin in jesus christ he's no longer dealing with my sin in me because i put my faith in jesus christ now i'm moving on to something else god's going to deal with my unrighteousness which paul begins to talk about because now i have been declared righteous all of my sin past present and future have been dealt with you go well that's impossible well then you and i have a problem because when jesus christ died you and i both weren't alive so when Jesus died, he died for the sins of the past, the sins of the present, and the sins of the future. And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we receive justification by faith. The just shall live by faith. Let me read verse 26 again. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be both just and the one who justifies. I mentioned that already. To be justified means to be regarded or treated just as if you'd never sinned and he's going to bring this passage back i think in chapter eight or, or that phrase again both just the one who is just and justifies those who have faith in jesus christ verse 27 where then is boasting it is excluded who can brag before god no one because of what law the law that requires works no because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart or separate from the works of the law. Verse 29, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. 
since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. That's God's word. Okay, at the end there, uh, he talks about the the value of the law and that there are some people, especially in, in, in Israel, Jews around the world, that live according to the law, not believing that the law makes them righteous, but believing that the law was what God gave for them to live by. And they lived that out by faith. They lived that out knowing that there's a Messiah who uh, removes their sin. They may still be waiting for that Messiah, believing for that Messiah. Obviously, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he came, he died, and he rose again. But Paul says there are some who are living this out by faith. They're, they're obeying the law by faith, not by works. You see, works of the law don't require faith. If I go out and I go, I'm going to do these 10 things, and when I do these 10 things, it makes me right before God. That doesn't require faith. It requires work. I have to go and do them. But it doesn't require me believing that God is going to receive that because of some reason outside of myself. And Paul's trying to bring that at the end here and talk about that God is a God of both of the Gentiles and the Jews and that the law is good, as I mentioned. The law is good. We uphold the law. The Jews believe that righteousness came from obeying the law, that through their behavior, through their works, through their flesh, they could obtain righteousness and holiness that God required. That's what they believed. And that's not what Paul is arguing here. Paul is saying that the law is helpful, but that the law didn't justify anybody before God. That's not, that wasn't its purpose, nor could it accomplish that. Only Jesus would be able to accomplish that. And only God is true, and only God is faithful, and only God is holy. That's when he goes through this whole little section here. No one is righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. He talks about... There's no one who really wants to know God. We, we, we can't forget the bad news. The bad, you appreciate the good news when you really understand and believe that there is bad news. But there is good news. Sorry. God is holy and we are sinners, right? So that, that, that's truthful and that's the bad news and the good news. God is holy. We are sinners. How are we reconciled? Through the person of Jesus Christ. Christ. And then Paul talks about this sacrifice, that God sent this sacrifice. He presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement in verse 25. Now that, uh, the Greek word for sacrifice of atonement uh, is, is, if you want to go through it, you could go back to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 16, um, and it talks about, uh, it, it just talks about the requirements of the blood and the lamb and the animal. It had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect. Jesus was that perfect lamb. All of those things were pointing to Jesus Christ. Jesus was the perfect lamb sacrificed by God for our sins, and it was accepted and then Paul talks about uh, that God demonstrates his righteousness. Now, I love this. You, 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 we can't skip this. We, we got to park on this just for a little bit. Let me see. Uh, verse 25, towards the end. Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. And then verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness. Now, you might think, well... The holiness of God was displayed on the cross to demonstrate my sinfulness, right? Look at all that Jesus had to do. What a mess. What a mess. Oh my gosh. I didn't know it required that much, right? We can kind of sob and make it all about us. And if Paul is saying, no, 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 yes, that those, all those things are true. It was a mess and you required all of this. But God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. He did it to demonstrate that he is good. Why did God save you? Why did God save me? He didn't save you and me because we are good. He saved us because he is good. When God does something, it's because of his nature. It's because of who he is. Remember, 
God cannot be changed. He cannot be altered. He cannot be influenced. God is immutable. He doesn't get better or worse. He doesn't, he doesn't get smarter or dumber. God cannot be made better. He cannot be improved. God is who He is. So God is demonstrating His righteousness. He's not responding to something and feeling like, oh, I forgot that one. Let me go deal with that. No, no, no. God is who He is, and He demonstrates His righteousness. This was His plan from the beginning, that God would demonstrate to us, I am kind, I am merciful, I am good, I am righteous, I am just, I will deal with sin, but I will deal with it on a personal level. I will come down as the Son of God. I will come as the Son of Man and God the Son, and I will reconcile all things to myself. To what? To demonstrate that you're a sinner? No, to demonstrate that I am righteous. It is because of the righteousness of God. To demonstrate His righteousness. God is declaring that He is good, that He is merciful. God is dealing with sin as a justifier and declaring us forgiven. So he is just and justifier. He is just in dealing with sin, but he justifies us through our faith in Jesus Christ. Man, that is so good. And then he ends with upholding the law and the value of the law. The law is good. I want to say that again. This is not about bashing the law. It's not, Paul's not trying to say that the law is bad. You got to throw it away. He's saying that the law is good. It is very, very good. In fact, it's so good, it, it, we can't even live up to it. That was the point. The law was given. If I go back, therefore, verse 20, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Man, that's a good chapter. God declares his righteousness through Jesus Christ. The law can't save us, but God has saved us through Jesus Christ. You know, when we think of righteousness, uh, it's important for us to remember that. Let me give you a, a little illustration before we close with a couple of questions. If you have a bank account, uh, let's say you have a business account, rather. You have a business account and you've racked up debt. This business, you got a startup, and first it was 5000 10000 100000 200000 500000 and now it's up to $1.5 million of debt. No way. Your source of income cannot cover that. You're nowhere near that amount of money. And now you've got an issue because the bank is calling you and saying, hey, you got to pay up this debt. And you go to the bank and you're trying to reconcile the account and you're going, I, I don't know what to do. And they go, well, we can take away your businesses. We can take away this. We can take away your property here. We can take it all as collateral. And they, they're going through the process with you. And then the bank manager comes out and says, you know what? Don't worry about it. We are going to demonstrate our kindness, demonstrate our righteousness to you. We're going to wipe out your debt. And they wipe out your debt completely. Okay, $1.5 million in debt wiped out. You no longer need it. It's gone. Okay, you leave the bank with an empty account. Okay, Jesus came to remove your sin and my sin. Empty account. The problem is righteousness. Now, when I leave the bank, using this analogy, I'm still, I still got nothing. I have nothing. My account's been brought to zero, but I have nothing in my account. I'm still zero. Jesus came to clear the account from sin, but he also came to fill your account with his righteousness. Listen to me. He came to fill your account with his righteousness. You're no longer trying to be righteous in your own efforts because Christ has made you righteous. Now, this is not to say that you have permission to live however you are. Paul dealt with this in Romans chapter 2. There was this argument, well, if God has made me righteous, I can live however I want. No, that's not it at all. And Paul goes into this in other chapters. We've been declared righteous. I'm righteous before God in my standing, my state. I'm learning to live in righteousness. But before God, when God looks at me, he sees me as righteousness. Why? Because of his son, Jesus Christ, to demonstrate his righteousness he came and died so that I would inherit his righteousness. To, 
to declare to the world that he is that good. Okay, let me close with a couple of reflection thoughts for you. Question number one, is it hard for you to receive the gift of God's righteousness? Just what I was talking about. Is it hard for you to receive the gift that God has made you righteous? Is it hard for you to receive that in your mind and in your heart? To believe that? When you wake up in the morning, as you go about your day, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Is that hard for you to receive it? Question number two. Which law do you find yourself living under the law of Moses or the law of faith? Which law do you find yourself living under? Are you living under the law of Moses or are you living under the law of faith? Paul talks about the law of faith to believe and trust that Jesus Christ has reconciled me. Every day I get up, which law am I under? I got to do, not do. Do, not do. Is your consciousness a sin consciousness? I'm not going to sin today. I'm not going to sin today. I'm not going to sin today. Or is your day start off, does your day start off with the law of faith? I am righteous in Christ. I am declared righteous in Christ. I am not sin conscious. I am son conscious. I am conscious of the Son of God. I am conscious of what He has done. I am conscious of His love, His grace, His mercy, that His righteousness has been given to me, that He has declared me justified before God. Which law are you living under? Man, let's allow the Holy Spirit to dig into our business with those two because those are very, very important in understanding the good news of the gospel and understanding our salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's also very important if we're going to continue this study together as we build upon this gospel that God has revealed apart from the law, this good news, this righteousness as God has revealed in Jesus Christ. It's very important for us to come to clarity and alignment because the other chapters are going to build upon that some more. That's Romans chapter 3. One of my favorites in there. I hope it blessed you, and I hope you learned something. We'll pick it up on the next chapter, chapter 4.